Hello. I'm excited to be talking today about scaling Kubernetes. Uh, most of the time when we talk about scaling Kubernetes, we're talking about going to 5,000 nodes or auto scaling or that type of thing. But I'm talking about something different. How can we scale our user base? How can we bring Kubernetes not just to everybody in this room, but all the people who aren't in this room? How can we actually appeal to larger and larger audiences? So first, um, Kubernetes sucks. <laughs> and it sucks in the way that all software sucks. And one of the depressing things about being in the software industry is recognizing how close to the abyss we really are. And, and you know, you really just understand sort of like it's amazing that anything works at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so with that in mind, I think, you know, for us to improve and to bring this to a larger audience, we have to actually take a really hard look at the places where we can do better. Now, KubeCon is a place to celebrate Kubernetes. It's a place to celebrate all the progress that we made. And it's a place to really be re-energized, come away with new ideas, and meet folks that, you know, perhaps we've only met online. And so that's all wonderful, and I don't want to take away from that. But again, we have to take a really hard look at where we're at if we're going to improve and uh, continue on the trajectory that we're on. Uh, so this, um, uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be making really bad physics analogies. The last physics class that I took was about 20 years ago, so I'm sure I'm going to get stuff wrong. Please bear with me. Uh, this is about vacuum because see sucking, and vacuum tubes. And so this is an animation of this computer in the uh, uh, British National Museum of Computing in Bletchley Park, uh, outside of London. Uh, it's a thing called the Witch, and these things are a special type of vacuum tube called a Decatron that knows how to count to 10. So it's a really cool place. I recommend you go there if you ever get the chance. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about here is sampling bias. Uh, we, uh, you know, Kubernetes, and I've been saying this to a lot of folks, is system software built by systems engineers for systems engineers. Um, and we love it for it, right? I mean, it really speaks to us uh, because it has that sensibility. But not everybody is like that. And so one of the classic mistakes that we make is building software for people like us. And the thing that we need to do is actually recognize that our users are not necessarily like us, and they don't necessarily see the world in the way that we see it. So this is a uh, humpback whale, and they have this thing called a baleen, which is a filter. So they suck in a whole bunch of water with krill, and then they push the water out, and, uh, and that thing acts as a sieve to actually keep the yummy bits inside so that they can swallow it. Um, and so we, we, we can't be like the whale here, uh, and we have to actually uh, recognize that we have to look beyond our, uh, our immediate uh, peers and, and what we need out of Kubernetes. So now let's talk about refraction. Uh, so refraction is, is the interface between materials that causes light to bend. And uh, the analogy here is really one of viewpoints. There are different people bring different viewpoints and look at Kubernetes through different lenses. Uh, I could put a picture of an elephant up here also and touching different parts of an elephant, that type of thing. Um, and I think there's two main users or hats that people wear when they're actually using Kubernetes. And you'll see this reflected in the talks here today. The, there's the cluster operator the folks who are really interested in getting a cluster up and running and making sure that it runs well. And that's a hat that folks wear. And then there's the cluster user. And uh, the cluster user is interested in, OK, now that I have a cluster, how do I get the most out of it? And it's easy when you're working with these things day in and day out to really blur the lines between those things. Uh, but we have to make sure that we can build the right experiences when people are wearing those different hats and that we can create a world where people who have no idea how Kubernetes works under the covers can be successful. Uh, I don't think we're quite there yet, uh, but I think we have, uh, um, we're, we're on our way for sure. Now, we can't overfit to that. There's this idea in UX design called personas, where you sort of make up a, a person, you give them a name, you give them a backstory, and it really helps to create user empathy. One of the failure modes in my mind for that type of model is that you tend to create siloed experiences that are so separate that uh, learnings in one space don't transfer over to the other. So we really need to balance this stuff out. So this image here uh, is on the cover of my uh, uh, error analysis book when I was in college about 20 years ago. And still, if you, do error, if you type error analysis book into Google, you'll still see this photo. This is an accident that happened in 1895 in Paris, where a train was coming into a station, overran the, the station, and fell onto the street below. It turned out that the station was on the second floor. 
Um, and for me, this represents the spectrum from mathematics to physics. And even within physics, you have theoretical physics and experimental physics all the way to engineering. And, uh, and, and it's this sort of purity to, to, um, to sort of practicality sort of spectrum. And now there's a joke in there somewhere, like an engineer and a physicist and a mathematician walk into a bar, and I'll let you fill in the rest. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think we have a similar type of thing going on with Kubernetes, right? Like, there is this core distributed system. There's theory there. There's a lot of really interesting problems in terms of how do we actually scale to 5,000 machines? How do we actually do control loops and control theory? A lot of really interesting stuff there. And then there's folks who just want to get some stuff done. Right? And we have to recognize that not everybody wants to or needs to care about those core distributed systems because they're really focused on accomplishing some sort of task. And a, a flip side of this is recognizing that just because somebody doesn't care about these hardcore distributed systems problems doesn't mean that they're not as smart as the people who are working on those types of things. It just means that they're concerned with other stuff. Right? And, uh, and this is part of that viewpoints of different people are bringing different viewpoints to the game, and we have, to, we have to build empathy and respect the fact that not everybody is system geeks like us. So the, the physical world naturally over time tends towards disorder. Uh, this is the second law of thermodynamics. And the same thing happens with open source projects. Given time, they sort of grow and, and end up swallowing more and more and more and more. Uh, and it's something that we have to keep an eye out for with Kubernetes. The truth of the matter is, is that for most users, the primitives that we had two or three versions ago are probably good enough. We've been adding all these great features, and they are wonderful, they're innovative, but they don't necessarily uh, uh, move the needle in terms of bringing Kubernetes to this wider audience. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing that stuff, but we should also recognize that every new object that we add to the system, every new concept, creates barriers for no new users and creates confusion. Uh, and so we need to find a way to segment this so that we actually can present a more approachable face to the world, and folks can actually start recognizing and, and using those features as they need them instead of being forced to confront all that complexity out of the gate. So in physics, there's this idea, in the high energy physics, there's this idea of the standard model, right? So this is a theoretical model that predicts uh, fundamental particles, subatomic particles, and, uh, and guides the experimentation in terms of uh, uh, high energy physics and particle accelerators. So this is an image of a spark chamber from a proton-antiproton -proton, uh, collision. Uh, spark chambers were one of the earlier ways that folks used to visualize uh, these types of collisions. And, um, and there's a beauty in the, this idea of the standard model and the symmetry that you see out of that. And I think that if you look at the core of what we've built with Kubernetes, there's a similar type of symmetry and consistency that I think really resonates with lots of folks. Uh, and I think there's places where we really get this right. I think, um, you know, there's some warts and some stuff that I would change, but if you look at the Kubernetes API, the way we do labels, the way that we handle metadata, the um, uh, the spec versus status uh, bifurcation, the way we do controller loops. All that stuff, I think, really resonates and really helps people to understand one part of the system and then apply it elsewhere. There's also places where we're not doing quite as well. Uh, if you look at cube control, uh, you can run it in two modes, sort of this declarative mode versus this imperative mode. And there's a sort of Venn diagram set of features that are available to each of those things. So we really put users in an in, in uh, inconvenient position of having to choose between one model and the next. Uh, for example, uh, Cube Control Run supports this way of uh, essentially attaching to it, like you feel like you're SSH'd into the, into the container, and it supports an auto-remove feature so that when the, the process ends, it'll automatically delete it and clean up after itself. Uh, you can't get that when you're actually doing a cube control create, and there's no way to actually get that behavior elsewise. Uh, meanwhile, with cube control run, it's very difficult to be able to do a cube control run and attach a volume to it, right? So we've put people in this position where either you do the manifest and you can actually get full access to all the features, but you lose out on some of these sort of, you know, niceties around, around uh, interacting with it, or vice versa. So there's some, some room for improvement there. Uh, so now I'm going to contradict myself. I'm going to talk about specialization. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, there are times when you have to go the opposite direction from this sort of like simple fundamental beauty of physics. And in my mind, the opposite of physics is really biology, right? There's this amazing amount of diversity. Uh, these are, are Mendel's peas, the father of genetics. Um, and, uh, and what I'm trying to get across here is that we have to recognize that as we try and reach these new audiences of developers and users of Kubernetes, we have to build experience that resonate with them. So let's take front-end developers, for example. The typical front-end developer flow is that you have your browser in one window, you have your editor in one window, you hit save, and the browser automatically updates. You don't even have to reload it, right? This is sort of state-of-the-art how folks use and work with this stuff. How does that translate into a world where maybe your backend is written in Kubernetes? Maybe you want to start working that way, but you want to easily transition from that mode to being able to deploy things. Right now, there's a very, very uh, abrupt translation as you move from that development experience to that deployment experience. So let's get you know, creative about thinking about how we can solve some of those problems and start blurring those lines so that we can create an experience that feels more natural to that type of user. Now, this is where the rubber meets the road. Okay, that's a really bad joke, I'm sorry. Uh, so, a big part about getting new users on board is removing friction. Uh, and, and so there's two, you know, at least two types of friction that I think relate here. There's static friction and kinetic friction. And so static friction is the amount of force that it takes to start something moving. Kinetic friction is the amount of force that it takes to keep it moving. And so the analogy here for Kubernetes is really that there is a certain amount of mental friction. This is, you know, it just feels like work to get started with Kubernetes. Uh, for the cluster administrators, there's a gazillion different ways to actually bring up Kubernetes. Picking one of those in and of itself creates a ton of friction. Uh, for users, like I mentioned earlier, there's just so many concepts to wrap your head around. And we really don't do a good job of actually providing a simpler way to get in. Uh, and then there's a lot of rough edges that we need to sand off. There's, uh, and, you know, and I'm just going to give you a couple examples here. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. So, okay, so the first thing here is uh, let's talk events, right? Events are only available when you do like a cube control describe, and they give you some of the recent things that happened to a particular object. They're incomplete, they get GC'd, and it's almost impossible to actually get events for objects that have been deleted. Right? I mean, they're there, but it's very difficult to filter for that. Not the end of the world, right? But it's just a piece of friction. Um, OK, so let's say that you launch a pod, and it fails to launch, and you do a describe, and you get an error that says, failed sync error syncing pod. So this is an actual error. I, I, haven't, I haven't hit in 1.5. I mean, I, I tested in 1.5. I haven't tried this yet in 1.6. Um, does anybody know what this error means? No? This means that you forgot to actually specify a command on your container image. Yeah, that's, that's not a great experience. Cube <laughs> uh, uh, control logs. Um, it turns out that when you do a run, and we encourage everybody to think in terms of replica sets and deployments, but when you want to go ahead and get logs, logs only work on pods. And so you have to do this dance where you have to actually go through and list the pods and like, you know, look at the name and actually say, I think that's the one that maps to this deployment. Copy and paste that in the command line to cube control logs, and then you can actually see what the hell's going on. Um, none of these things are, are awful. None of them are going to block you. They're just going to slow you down, and it makes the system feel sort of slow and rough around the edges. And I, I believe there's issues for all of these, so, you know, help wanted. Um, let's, let's solve some of this. Uh, I want to take a step back also, and um, a lot of folks build businesses around removing friction. In fact, that is sort of the, the, one of the things that startups do is that you find something that, that just causes this friction that people have gotten attuned to and are, makes it easy to ignore, and you remove that in exchange for money. Um, that's great, but there's also a danger for us as a, as a community with respect to this. If people solve these issues from the outside instead of fixing fundamental issues in the, issues in the product, then they're essentially building businesses that are predicated on Kubernetes sucking. And over the long term, that means that nobody's going to be incentivizing to actually move the project itself forward. So we need to balance this idea of solving problems on top and of and above Kubernetes, uh, but not at the cost of inhibiting ourselves from solving core problems upstream. Um, 
So I want to return to this idea of there's just so many concepts that users have to think about when they start using Kubernetes. And, and I think one of the solutions here is finding ways in, and again, we're going to have to get creative here, of how we can present a friendlier view to the system that is not invalidated as you become a more advanced user and as you actually get access to these more advanced concepts. And so the analogy here, and I love this, is, is Newtonian versus Einsteinian physics. So the first equation I have here is force equals mass times acceleration. So acceleration is the change of velocity over time. And uh, for hundreds of years this stood. It was wonderful. It meets our intuition with how the way the world works. But it turns out that in special cases, in more advanced cases, as you get close to the speed of light, this breaks down. Right? And so if you look at the second equation, this is, this is the Einsteinian special relativity version of this equation. And what you'll notice is that there's that, that square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. That's the Lorentz factor. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that as velocity tends towards 0 compared to, to the speed of light, that whole thing reduces down to 1 and disappears. Right? And so it's not like there's this cutover point where you move from the, the Newton view of the world to the Einstein view of the world. It just means that gradually that thing becomes more impor important as you actually start dealing with more and more advanced situations. So we need to find a way so that, that for most users we can present that intuitional view of the world that is the, the Newtonian view. But then as they hit more special cases, they get access to the more advanced ways of looking at things. All right, so um, any talk talking about uh, physics uh, analogies would be incomplete unless we had Schrodinger's cat. Uh, so this is, this is a surprise. Uh, I didn't expect to see, see that in the box when I opened it. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, uh, like, like anything else, um, you know, you don't know your, if your cluster is alive or dead until you look at it. And, uh, and observability is one of those things that we just always need to be doing better with. Um, and by observability, it really, I think this is a term that's evolving to encapsulate logging, events, tracing, monitoring, all this stuff really adds together in terms of having the tools to see what's going on. Now, so much of the uh, thinking and the efforts has been going into application observability, right? What's happening with my application that's running on top of it? And, you know, great projects like, like Prometheus and FluentD are really helping out there. Um, but those things work best when they actually work with the application, right? If you make your application observable, then you can observe it. We need to do a better job of, of both helping to bring users along there, and, you know, as a community, but also in terms of making Kubernetes itself more observable. We could easily have 10 times as many Prometheus metrics thrown off by the system to be able to figure out what the heck's going on. Uh, if you look at our event stream, I mentioned that earlier, it's incomplete. We're not treating it as a real API. We're not providing the right ways to be able to capture that over time and examine what's going on. Uh, I was talking to one Kubernetes user, and uh, this was in the 1.4 time frame, and they had a cluster freak out on them, and they sent me two days' worth of logs, and it was six gigabytes. And so I was trying to actually paw through six gigabytes' worth of logs, and it's not easy. And even if the data was in there that I needed someplace, there's collecting that data and then being able to make sense of the data, right? So we need to be able to find tools such that when users do need to look under the covers and figure out what's going on, which is something that I think users and I think a lot of folks in this room do appreciate is that you can tear a cluster apart and understand what's going on. But when you do that, we need to provide you the right tools so that not only do you have the data that you need, but you actually can extract signal out of that and actually figure out what's going on. So that's a bunch of ideas, some things to think about as we look towards what is it going to take to, to take Kubernetes to the next level, grow our user base by 10 times, and, and really inject a whole new level of energy into this community and, and continue on the velocity that we're at right now. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And uh, feel free to tweet at me um, if you have any questions or want to talk about this some more. Thank you.